<clears throat> okay, why don't we get started? And yeah. then, uh, Tracy, if uh, Bob shows up, would you please let him in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll keep an um, eye out. Call the uh, meeting to order. That's my uh, my mallet here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you for everybody showing up and participating. Uh, and I think we, we uh, absolutely need to start off by just thanking all the our frontline medical and emergency workers who are doing such a wonderful job. Um, and also the, all those uh, essential workers as well, which includes the RMLD employees um, doing a great job in, in these uh, dire times. Um, so I hope everyone's been staying safe and let's proceed uh, to the meeting. Um, I'm, uh, <clears throat> this is where we usually uh, um, read before the meeting. This meeting of the Ready Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is being recorded via Zoom for distribution to the community television stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public uh, comment or ensuing discussion. Uh, Phil, would you mind being the uh, board secretary today? Yes, I'm the board secretary for the, for the whole year. Don't oh. you know that? Oh, I didn't realize that. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to ask that question again. Um, yeah. Could uh, everyone uh, please identify themselves because we're on the Zoom and it'd be good to do that. Uh, I'll start, we'll go through the board and then um, everyone else in the room. I'm uh, John Stempeck, uh, the Chairman of the Board of Commissioners. I'm Dave Hennessy, Vice Chair for, of the Commissioners. Uh, Dave, Dave Pacino, Board Member, sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Phil uh, just Dave Phil Talbot on the board. Yeah. Well, Phil Pacino, the Senior Member of the Board. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And secretary for the year. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we have a CAB member, please. Yeah, I'm Vivek Sony, uh, CAB member from Reading. Thank you. And um, uh, the RMLD people, please. Colleen O'Brien, general manager. Hamid, Hamid Jafari, director of engineering and operations. John Wendy Markowitz, the, sorry, John. Wendy Markowitz, Director of Business Finance and Technology. John McDonough, the Assistant Director of Engineering and Operations. Thank you. Tracy Schultz, Assistant. Chuck Underhill, Integrated Resources Director. Thank you. And uh, for the other members from the Select Board, if you could please introduce yourselves. Vanessa Alvarado, Select Board Liaison. Karen Herrick, Running Select Board. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so the um, uh, we usually start this with um, feedback from the RMLD Citizens Advisory Board um, from the CAB. And uh, okay. would, you, would you care to comment on the recent meeting? Okay. So... Um, the cab met last week and we got some information on topics that are going to be covered tonight, specifically items number five, seven, eight, nine, and 10, which are on your agenda, at least the published agenda, are topics that we got information on. So rather than talk about those, I think, you know, I'll let that information be mentioned during the meeting. Okay. But I think the, the main point was that the CAB is satisfied with how RMLD is addressing these uh, tough times. And I think that will be uh, discussed and presented by the different representatives from RMLD. The only other point is that I have reached out to the town managers. I think RMLD is reaching out to all the different towns to get the extension for the 20 year agreement. Uh, mentioned ab meeting last week and i have reached out to the town manager and to some select board personnel at reading and 
I think that issue has not yet been addressed thing and they, they, they are, at least I've made them aware of it. I've, I've talked, sent emails about it and I've also yeah. talked with Karen earlier today. So it, it's, it's a topic that I think all the towns need to address. Okay, thank you, Vivek. Uh, uh, comments from the uh, liaisons to the RMLD board from the select persons? Thanks, John. Um, yes, Vivek, we did receive your email. Thank you for that. Um, the board had been interested in pursuing this um, with the new board seated after the election, but the priority, honestly, in the last month plus has been in addressing COVID-19. Um, so, uh, Karen, if, if you're comfortable, I can bring this up to the chair um, to see when we can have this added to our next agenda. We're meeting weekly now in order to give the community upda updates on COVID-19. So we should be able to find time. But unfortunately, we haven't had an opportunity just yet. Sure, okay, thank you. Thanks. Karen, anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I really appreciate the fact that we've had power almost this entire pandemic. And <laughs> thank God for great <laughs> customers. Thank you very much. Um, and I live, I live near Meadowbrook, so I figure like we've been testing your system, so it's been great. <laughs> Especially with the fire at Meadowbrook, right? Exactly. Um, I did want to let you know that uh, my last meeting as a Reading Finance Committee member, I did um, directly ask uh, our town manager about, you know, in the event that um, RMLD wanted to issue some debt going forward, um, we would, Reading would absolutely be supportive and then we'd bring it to town meeting. And um, the interesting thing is that you would, um, I don't know all the ins and outs, but the, um, I know you have a fabulous debt rating and so does Reading. So the, either one would work, uh, the credit ratings, if you were to do that in the future. And um, so just want to put that out there. Um, we're, we're behind you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we'll certainly take that into consideration. Um, as you know, we're a very conservatively run organization for the uh, length of time we've been in existence. So we've we've tried to do our best to stay away from debt, but you know, there's always times when you may want to reconsider it. So we'll certainly take that under advisement. Um, uh, if we could move on to uh, item number five, uh, RMLD's response to COVID-19, um, Colleen. Well, I'm going to let Hamid do that, but before uh, I pass it over to him, um, I just want to announce that we still have no illnesses here at the RMLD. We still have full business and electric continuity. Um, maybe a little bit later we can have John give an update from the last storm, but we, uh, we did very well. Um, and uh, Hamid will talk about some of the phasing. We were extremely proactive when this virus came out because we do, uh, we do provide essential services. And when you do have to continue to provide safe and reliable electricity, it, we are very familiar with getting into the emergency action mode. Um, so I'll let Hamid go through some of the phasing. We are working now on coming up with our part of our procedure under our EOP for infectious disease of um, remobilizing us back towards normal operations, which um, we'll have, you know, we will continue to follow state, federal, and local um, uh, guidelines. But we were finding out that there are a lot of efficiency measures, automation and stuff that we will, we will keep intact that have been working really well. But when I get done with that report, I'll be sure to send it out but I will turn it over to Hamid. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. And I appreciate the support that we've been receiving during the COVID-19 from all uh, town departments, as well as, you know, uh, the board members, their support and everyone. So uh, I'm gonna give you an update uh, on the inf infectious disease plan uh, uh, for the emergency uh, plan of operation as well, as well as the major emergency plan of operations. The first thing we, we oh, thought we're going to talk I'm about. Sorry, I'm sorry, Tracy, are you putting up a... Yeah, are we, is this the presentation? Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, Hamid. No. Right, that's fine. That way we can just quickly go through the slides. We're just going to give a quick summary. Sorry. Can you see that's it? Right. Yeah, yeah I, we can see that. Yes. The first slide. Yes. Okay. Give me a. You, you, could you go to the next one, yeah. please? Yeah. Uh, 
This one? All right, great, yes. And, and Phil, so hopefully, uh, Phil, hopefully you've seen these uh, when they were emailed out. I actually see, they're on my computer. I can oh. see them. Oh, good, excellent. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I see them. Well, the uh, RMLD management team, we set up the emergency response. The response team included uh, of the directors from all departments, business finance, uh, engineering operations, IRD, and we may, we've been doing the Zoom uh, daily meeting conference, uh, uh, video conference meetings at 10 a.m. Uh, with a full agenda to cover uh, all the facts, the updates and everything. As far as the employees concerned, we, uh, we immediately implemented the social distancing, uh, separating the trucks, and we provided iPhones, iPad, and also for the, the employees when we train them on the Zoom, how to use that for the team meetings, uh, including with the uh, operation personnel and also the unions. HR director, uh, Janet Walsh sent uh, out employees update via email uh, discussing the CDC and the town, public health and federal laws, internal communication, everything that, you know, employees they needed to know. With the facilities, we basically uh, checked all the filters throughout the building. The cleaning contractors were put on notification for deep cleaning and uh, take extra uh, care. Uh, following the sanitization of the building, uh, cleaning product uh, we upgraded. Uh, we know we also uh, provided gloves uh, for the employees and also the uh, the wipes, the sanitization wipes. Uh, suspended, we suspended all the non-essential pre pre preventative maintenance work. And we only focused on the emergency and the needed work, like the emergency generator um, maintenance work that we need, needed to get that done and maybe at, at the atten attention, needed attention. Uh, building closure per board uh, of health, which uh, board of health uh, recommendations and guidelines were followed and we, it was passed on to the employees. As far as the materials and supplies concerned, we made sure that, you know, we have one month uh, minimal uh, supplies for both electric and business side. And we contacted all the suppliers to see what the availability of the uh, supplies are. We reviewed our emergency purchasing laws to make sure that, you know, we follow them uh, and follow the state guidelines. With the IT, we basically provided uh, VPNs for remote work from home as the employees now they were working from home and some were from home and they needed to use that uh, to get the files from uh, RMLD to access the computer. They, ass uh, they assessed the vulnerability risks, uh, we updated the users, the we also watched the NERC uh, reliability compli uh, compliance issues to make sure that we follow those guidelines. Uh, under the town and customers, uh, Colleen represented town uh, uh, for RMLD in the town of uh, Reading Emergency Planning Committee. We provided press release, the constant con uh, contact uh, using the uh, uh, Zoom in order to uh, demonstrate and in order to have the board of selectmen and provide reports for all four towns. Notification to all the customers uh, for operations. Uh, we, we, we did that. The operations also switched from proactive to uh, reliability projects to maintenance directed related. The ones that you know they were immediate threat uh, uh, and uh, they, they were a threat to the reliability uh, uh, and only emergency uh, uh, services and also for the service connects and disconnects. These are the ones that we, we prioritized and we focused on. Uh, the uh, hardship on moratorium, uh, basically, which uh, the, uh, the law was pertaining to uh, property taxes. Uh, although that, you know, we, the, we, we work with the customers move on their payment plans, we cannot, uh, you know, we don't have the rate doctoring uh, to waive or discount. Also, the discounts are not a late fee. However, we work with the customers in order to come up with the payment plan during these uh, uh, tough times. All the businesses and electric continuity, they, uh, they are intact as of April 13th. The next slide, please.
Uh, okay, emergency plan of operation and major emergency plan of operations was uh, reviewed in detail. The prepared emergency plan of operation for which was for greater than minimum staffing and also major emergency plan of operation, which is less than the minimum staffing. We established all electric uh, and business continuity functions and established remote work uh, capabilities for the staff evaluated the plans and also moved from large capital to maintenance uh, work. We maintained uh, all on-site uh, contractors to overhead one underground or qualified contractors. They have a knowledge of the system just in case that, you know, something happens so they know exactly what, what's expected of them doing. And we have a good, these are good contractors. We've had good, great uh, experience with them. Uh, we maintain the facilities crews and all, uh, also the uh, stock persons on site physically uh, with the social distancing, of, obviously. We review the, all the union contracts uh, for flexibility and we, stay, we established the uh, Zoom uh, with uh, unions uh, for uh, possible side letters, but we didn't need to really do that. They've been co very cooperative as far as, you know, the contra contract concerns. We reviewed previously identified and um, maps of the town with critical infrastructure. We updated them. Basically, on those maps, we updated the town hall uh, 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 facilities, uh, like police departments, fire, water, sewer, uh, pumping stations, all the nursing homes, uh, assisted living facilities. All of those were identified on the maps just in case there's an outage, uh, how quickly we could, you know, put them, bring them back uh, to power. Uh, we reviewed the contingency plans for loss of the substations. Uh, just uh, to check the substation maintenance, update all the substation equipment. We made sure that they are testing or they are up to date, which they are. And also Wilmington substation, which remains on a closed watch. As you know, that's our oldest substation. We did the single contingency analysis just in case the substation is lost or something happened to the substation, how we could support the load. The next slide, please. Uh, so these are to be the, the defined some phasing, the, the phasing in order to, uh, you know, to define which group and team up the people. So in each phase, so we can continue the electric uh, and business continuity. So employee phasing one, uh, that's uh, emergency plan of operation, which means greater than minimum staffing. We set up team A and B that, you know, they work from home and office. Uh, we switch to electronic signatures, the contracts, bids, wires, everything, you know, immediately, you know, we uh, switch to electronic uh, signatures uh, set up uh, using the PDF uh, files. And we set up the operation team A and team B, the line ops and substations, you know, they were separated, physically separated at different locations on the campus. And they're all on call duties, weekend trouble shifts also. Saying engineering, uh, we have five we have five control authorities, which three they're working from home and two physically uh, distance with the field, and they're ready uh, to for calling duties uh, if something happens. So they were all set up uh, nicely, and it's been, it's been working out well, great. The next slide, please. The phase two uh, was again emergency plan of operations with minimum staffing. And the business team A and B started uh, implementing all the Adobe signatures, preparing their residential commercial payment plans. Uh, we developed revenue impact study and for the rate classifications, the operations and engineering team and B, A, A and B, they started rotating. So one week at home, another week at work. And uh, that's been working out really great. The team that they're working from home, they're on call that they could report to work uh, in a short uh, uh, time period if they called in. For the storm response, team A and B, they physically, the distance uh, report to uh, locations and uh, trouble response restoration assignments are very clearly defined. So if they uh, they come in, they're gonna be separated at station four and also at the 230 Ash Street. So 
they have uh, physical separations. Also, within the groups, they have the uh, minimum distances of uh, six foot uh, separations. A weekend OT immediately suspended, or we got suspended for non-emergency works, and we limited everyone to eight hours of shift per work, no 16-hour shift schedules. 12-hour uh, shift for Saturday, Sundays remained with the for the trouble workers, unless uh, it's storm-related. You know, we, we, which we just recently experienced on April 13th, uh, and we brought everybody in. So it, it really worked. Uh, all the team A and B, everybody reported to work and worked really nicely with the setup that we had already defined. The next slide is the phase three. Phase three is the time that we call it the major emergency plan of operations. That's for minimum staffing. That is the situation where COVID-19 is next or a coincidence with the storm or any type of like major substation losses. And this is the one we have a plan for that too, the business impact on team A and B. And we're basically redefined and we extended the the processes and procedures on the APs, payroll, billing, paper, payments, box, uh, pickup, and, uh, and uh, all of those. And the operations and engineering team A and B will be flexed. At that time, basically, we get all the qualified personnel in control room, line operations, and substations, and we secure hazardous areas during the storm and the post-storm re restoration ef efforts. Uh, we also contact the mutual aid, which we recently signed a contract with uh, uh, AP and NEPA. And we get every help that we can get. So uh, that's basically was the plan. And the lessons that learned in the next slide, basically, they, I'm not going to go through all of them, but basically these are the lessons that learned. You could read them uh, from this, uh, this exercise. Uh, basically, we're dealing uh, on a daily challenges with public health and the laws, uh, interpretations and applicability. And we've been in contact, you know, and getting uh, second interpretations from lawyers, from you know, that making sure that, you know, we interpret the laws correctly. And uh, uh, we've been, uh, you know, another we've been experiencing. I have personally experienced the Zoom bombing. I mean, the people, the hackers, they get on the Zoom and they try to, you know, uh, later on they send you the threatening emails. They want money. They want Bitcoin. <laughs> so be aware of that. Uh, the person, person, property tax deferrals. That's another thing that you know. Well, uh, it's uh, it's been you know it learned that during this process. And also the payment plan, plan that, you know, the utilities, all the municipal utilities they've come up with to work with their customers. So as RMLD, the town communication or RMLD uh, impact of operations, town of Reading, Board of Health. We've been following the Board of Health directives, which is basically the directives that are coming from the state. So we've been closely monitoring those and we pass those uh, directives to the contractors as well as we've gone over in details with our crews to make sure we follow uh, the rules and regulations and making sure that you know we are all uh, on the same page with uh, uh, the rest of the town departments. The town, uh, town communications, uh, we talked about the capital uh, to expense money shifting. So the capital projects now basically they're uh, on halt and we're focusing on the maintenance. The maintenance related when we're talking about, these are talking about when, you know, for the, the disconnect, connect, connecting the services, if uh, the transformer needs to, to be replaced, then it's not gonna cause an outage to the customer. That Those are the ones that, you know, we're still taking care of, setting poles and making sure that, you know, the reliability system is not compromised. So these are most of the activities that been going on and still going on. And uh, we were keeping, uh, we were hoping that, you know, we, uh, we go through this process uh, without any major incidents. Uh, lastly, I got a good news for you. Well, we, this year we got uh, the Reliability Award from APPA again for the second time. This is our second reliability award from APPA for having great reliability. Uh, that we got one in 2017 and another one in 2019 because our maintenance uh, level has been paying off really uh, and uh, the reliability is getting better and better. 
and we want to keep it that way hopefully for for the future so the people they don't have to uh, experience long extended outages which uh, which by in the past the storm also uh, I don't think we majority of the services, I mean, 99% were picked up less than 24 hours. And uh, only few that, you know, they were left. These are the ones that, you know, the uh, wire inspectors of the, the various towns, they needed to check to, for the safety in order to turn them back on. So that concludes uh, the report, my report. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Ami. That's uh, that was an excellent uh, report, Thank and uh, clearly, uh, I had seen the the uh, feedback on the award that the RMLD was given for reliability, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty spectacular. That in a relatively short period of of time, we've been able to, uh, with the extended efforts, be able to uh, secure such an award. Uh, are there any questions for Hamid? Um, I do, and I, I would just echo what, what, what John just said, Hamid, great job. And um, I had a question of when, when did you first implement the, you know, sort of these health policies with respect to when people are out in the field working and any social distancing or other sort of measures out in the field or, or at the site, when did that first happen? It was right at the beginning of uh, this COVID-19. That was back in March that the uh, no, social February distancing. February 28th. February 28th, you started implementing yeah. measures to keep people right. safe. Right. Or, and that and involved something like that, right? Right. That involved any construction activities happening, any utility-related construction activities. Right. And that was back in February. And um, I saw that the there was a similar order from the town governing non-utility construction that was about two weeks ago yes can i chime in on that yep so yeah so we had our first meeting at the end of february and then the town had their first emergency uh meeting uh on march march 2nd i believe um that you're talking about the uh the governor's order on construction and mm -hmm. the subsequent board of health so I had sent an email up to the town asking the Board of Health to consider the different categories that we have for construction. I gave five different categories with a lot of detail in it. Um, and I asked for an update because they had their vote last Monday. Uh, what I got in return, uh, uh, Jean Delio sent it to me, was an order from the Board of Health that is essentially discusses static construction. Mm -hmm. So a static construction would be like the parking lot or the roof, but yep. it's not electrical work out into the field. So John McDonough took uh, the order, extracted what we could do for non-static jobs, had a stand down meeting, uh, went over all of our policies, contacted their uh, contractor agency, um, and our employees had already been trained. So Paul yep. McGonigal for facilities will be discussing stand down with uh, with the static projects which are on hold but he can call them back to start finishing them up under that policy but board of health didn't really send out something that really applied to municipal workers on non-static projects so but we right. take we you take did it a of, month you did it a month earlier is what it sounds like you were you were on this a month earlier than that for you for the utility operations basically i you, I, I feel like you're reason. asking me two different questions um no, I'm, I'm just kind of, what I'm doing is calling out the great work of RMLD, what it seems like to me that that the department, Hamid, you, and John, were, were implementing safety measures late February. Yeah, right. when, when the governor issued his order, I, I basically sent all the contractors working on static home until such time they had COVID plans, and then we just waited for the Board of Health to come out with their order, but... Um, yeah, we trained our employees immediately, but I'm just saying, so yeah, we were very proactive with it, but I, when you're talking about specifically that order, it's static projects, which we no, don't I get have it. a lot of, yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, in the meantime, I believe uh, Bob uh, Coulter, you've joined us, correct? Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. He's I think you have to unmute your Hi, hi, hi folks. Hi, how are you? Good. Hi, hi Bob. I am, I am on. Sorry for being late. I totally zoned. It's okay, um, and I, 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 I'm out literally walking my dog, and uh, I'm like, oh my goodness, 
So, hold on. <laughs> okay. We we do allow one rookie mistake as a new commissioner. <laughs> you get you get a reprieve. No yeah, problem. We, we've never been there ourselves, right? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, Hamid. Uh, You're welcome. The uh, the next uh, order of business is uh, the minutes, which I believe are going to be. We'll review those at our next meeting because we've been pretty busy, obviously, with uh, uh, all the other things that have been going on. Uh, so we'd like to move into the general manager's report. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so you, we guys talked about the 20-year agreement already with the town of Reading. So just an update with Wilmington. So I was on their board of selectmen meeting last week, gave a presentation, had uh, followed up with some questions that they had um sent me a couple of days prior i think they were very happy with um you know the thoroughness that i replied to their answers on uh the town manager jeff hull gave us a lot of kudos um about the value uh one of the questions detailed a lot of the value both customer service uh and rates um, we went through that and um so they took a vote and passed that so we still have the three towns left, and now that you know Vanessa and um, and Karen have discussed it, I will just follow up with Linfield and North Reading again with just another reminder uh, that those have to be done um, by May 31st is is what we're looking at um, 180 days from uh, the time that the 10 year renewal expires. So that's just a reminder. Um, if anybody needs me to forward some questions and values, I'm more than happy to do that. It makes me feel really good when we when you get a chance to write down everything that we're so good at. Um, all the benefits we have having a, a municipal light department when you compare it to IOUs, it's really quite uh, quite amazing. Um, the annual report I sent John, out. John, can I on, ask one question on that yeah, topic? Please. Sure, go right ahead, Colleen. What happens if all four towns haven't? come to an agreement and sign by May 30th, whatever. Well, actually, one of the one of the questions that was asked had to do with um, <clears throat> certain things of in the nature of changing the contract. So I was very clear legally that it takes two different directions. If you wanted to discuss, say, more advisory role in your town, or if you wanted to say, I need a little bit of a a delay because of COVID. Those are all things that the people that are in the agreement can sit down and talk about and discuss. They're well within the agreement. But let's say someone wanted to have an, an in lieu of tax payment increased. That is legislative. You can't, there's a whole bunch right. of things that you can't do inside of the agreement as just discussion, as a formal discussion. There's a lot of things that go back to special legislation. So you know, I'm more than happy to send the answers to the questions in. Um, but yeah, so if somebody needed a little bit of time because of COVID, I think if we got everybody together that we would still have to have a formal meeting, but I think it, it probably would be fine. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Um, so the annual report I sent out uh, last Friday. So even though the town meeting got postponed, it was still on the warrant to have the presentations. So um Maybe you guys got a chance to look at it. Uh, kids did a great job with the artwork and and um, and lots of accomplishments and stuff. But I did write a note in there that the financials are um, a little bit delayed because of COVID. And Wendy and I are working on that. And they are expected to be in and follow up as draft financials in June. Um, so then it will be a complete annual report. And... Um, you know, take a look at it. If you have any questions, um, you know, let me know. We try to make it pretty self-explanatory and give statistics and profiles and stuff that will help, uh, you know, make it a uh, worthy read. So, but uh, Wendy was still on for ju June, correct? Did we lose Wendy? No, she's un oh, unmuted. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay, great. And we uh, and I wrote we I wrote right on the last page that we don't expect any discrepancies in financials. It all looks good, and we pr present to the board every month, so it's just been chugging along. So it's just more of a formality, but we will we will make sure to to uh, follow that up um, promptly. Uh, Colleen, could you also talk about the uh, storm response? I believe that's one of the items. Sure. 
um, John, you want to give an update on that, please? Yes, absolutely. So uh, with the wind event that occurred on last Monday, we did have a total of 3,900 customers that were affected through our system. We did have the majority of those customers picked up and restored within the first 24 hours. As Hamid had alluded to, there were a few outliers that were associated with those restorations that needed wiring inspections for repair to their own personal property. Uh, but we were able to uh, work with our crews. We did split them in different shifts so that nobody was working more than 16 to 18 hours per shift. And we did uh, work through the night. There was a short period of time where we had to stand our crews down during the wind event because it was simply just too dangerous for our crews to be out working in the conditions that they were in with the high winds. We didn't want to put our employees into any type of situation where they may have gotten hurt. So we did have a short, brief hour and a half stand down while our crews were able to work on other things, but not get themselves into a dangerous situation. But all in all, we did have a full complement of our staff working the storm the entire time. We worked through the night and through the next day to make sure that everybody was restored in a uh, timely and safe manner. Thank you, John. Um, my understanding uh, is that uh, uh, the RMLD on a comparative basis uh, was far faster at restoring power than many other, whether they be municipals or ILUs in the state. Um, even a day or two later, there were still 10,000 plus people without power. Uh, is that, was your understanding as well? Yes, that is correct. National Grid uh, had peaked at over 80,000 customers without power and Eversource peaked at just around 78,000 customers without power and it turned into a multi-day event for those two IOUs. Thank you. I can attest to that. I was in the storm room, so we were in for two days. Oh, is that right? <laughs> That's right. We have got an inside guy there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. So we had a multi-day event from Sunday through Tuesday, and that was in the North Shore, and it extended into Wednesday in the South Shore. Very, very big event. Wow. If, if I can add something quick, John, is that okay? Please, go right ahead. So sometimes uh, we may have some residual folks out of power. Just remember that when our troublemen, and, and we, so during storms, we have bird dogs, which is uh, qualified engineers, technician, people that are available that will go out and identify whether a wire is Comcast or whether it's electric. And John's right, he called the stand down and then I sent emails out to all the police, fire and, and town managers telling them that we would just be identifying hazards and, and then, you know, to eliminate the electrical hazard, put out detour signs, and then we would come back for restoration efforts afterwards. But sometimes if um, trees take down services and it rips the service out of the house, uh, people have to understand that sometimes when we show up, we cannot reinstall the electricity until they get a, 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 the, um, an electrician and a wire inspector to do an um, inspection. Right. Because it's just physically not safe. So there's always going to be a few that take us a few days to work with, uh, with the wire inspector to get those back up. We're all back up with them now, John, are we? Yes, 100% we're restored. Okay, great. Good. Excuse me, Colleen. On, on your incident command structure, your control center, when th they were put into action, what was the plan or how did you guys handle their in the inside workers? Were they remote or were they socially distanced inside the building? How did you, how did you handle that approach? They were socially distanced inside the control room. We actually had three people in there, so they all had six feet distance. Yes. Two control room uh, operators and one community relations. So usually when the storm hits, uh, Joyce, who has the liaison phone, she has the GM liaison phone. Mm -hmm. She's sitting there working with them and tweeting out the information because we, we try to mitigate the amount of calls that come in so that they can dispatch and work with the engineers for switching the circuits. But so there was never more than three people in there with proper social distancing. That's correct. Okay, that's correct. Any other uh, questions? If not, I'd like to uh, suggest that we uh, move to number nine, integrated resources first, and then come back to the payment to the town of Reading update, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, yes. Jack, I think you're... You, you have to unmute, Chuck, I think. 
Here you go. <clears throat> so earlier this month, I was asked to uh, look at the uh, potential uh, financial ramifications of COVID-19, what it would do to our load, what would happen to our power supply portfolio in the wholesale market, uh, what were some of the potential impacts uh, to our uh, operations and our uh, budgets. So uh, I began that process. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, in order to assess the changes uh, across the uh, six areas listed here, uh, we have to break the, uh, the impacts out to those that are weather related, those that were actually COVID-19 related, and those that were due to other changes. Other changes include uh, new loads, uh, efficiency electrification program impacts, uh, solar, uh, economic factors, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we've begun the process of reviewing uh, the information relevant to RMLD for uh, how those impacts uh, are occurring and seeing if we can uh, focus down on COVID-19. Um, if you take a look at the next slide, please. Um, we also went out and got uh, some information uh, as to what is happening with other uh, entities that are in this uh, business and also in uh, at the top uh, impacted areas. It included Italy uh, and other APPA systems. What we found was that uh, for the second quarter of the year, the one we're in now, uh, they were experiencing a 6 to 10% drop in electric consumption. And for the rest of the year, the anticipated drop uh, was going to be about 7 to 9% uh, in electric consumption. So uh, to make life simple, uh, we focused it down to an 8% uh, load reduction for RMLD for the remainder of 2020. And that started our baseline analysis. Now, as we go through the process, and collect information specific to RMLD, we'll be able to tweak that number and go through and, and tweak the impacts. Uh, we're modifying our current uh, set of uh, tools and instruments to be able to do that. So the load forecasting capabilities are going to be there. The power supply modeling uh, will be there. And I'll be able to work with Wendy on some of the budget impacts. So if we take a look for the uh, remainder of the year, quarter two to quarter four, 2020, uh, anticipate selling 520,524 megawatt hours. And that's based on the load forecast for 2020. An 8% reduction is about 41,640 megawatt hours. So that's what we would expect to lose in wholesale load. A uh, slightly higher reduction in retail sales because of the distribution losses. So next slide, please. So we went back and we pulled out three years of historic data, uh, or two years of historic data in the budget, actually. And then um, those are the bars. And if you take a look at the uh, powder blue line going across the top, that is essentially the uh, 2020 uh, forecast. Uh, the first three months are as forecasted. And then April through the remainder of the year, we reduced uh, that by about 8%. Uh, if you look at the red dotted line, those are actual results, January, February, and March. This is what I mean by being, having to take out, for example, weather-related effects. Because January was the warmest January on record. And February was warm. March's sales were down. So we need to go through and discount those impacts uh, as we experience each month in order to isolate the COVID uh, impacts. So uh, next slide, please. So we made some assumptions for uh, being able to at least build a base case. We started with the 2020 budget as our baseline. The load forecast was prepared using normalized weather impacts 
and known and measurable changes pre-COVID-19. Uh, the revenues are anticipated on normal sales and expenses are anticipated on normal operations. Uh, and we used the uh, planned capital investment from the 2020 budget uh, or for the uh, five-year budget for 2020. Uh, so we went through and we looked at uh, financial mitigation capabilities. Um, we can use the uh, rate stabilization and deferred fuel funds. Uh, we have the ability to defer or avoid uh, expenses and capital investment. And uh, then we can look at the impacts of uh, a rate adjustment if we needed one for the remainder of 2020. Uh, so these were just all establishing sort of base case opportunities for us. Uh, they did not define a specific path uh, that we would be looking at. So what is unknown at this point? Well, until we get into it, we do not know the magnitude of the COVID-19 event. We assume the 8% reduction. We don't know the duration. We've assumed through the end of calendar 2020 for this exercise. So uh, next slide, please. So we looked at load impacts on the power supply budget. That's the 8% monthly reduction. Um, as we get information uh, from the various classes, we will be able to fine tune what uh, some of those load impacts look like month to month. We looked at the impacts on accounts receivable and uh, we set up a process where we are looking at the 30, 60, 90 day uh, outstanding balances on the receivables. We're also looking as we uh, get to our discount days, the, the last day of the prompt payment discount, uh, how many customers are paying the bills and, and taking advantage of the discount. So we'll be able to see how much the sales are down and then we'll be able to see uh, from the expected revenues what we're actually seeing come in. So it's kind of a two-step process for doing that. Um, we're also looking at the impacts on accounts payable. We have the ability to rerun the power supply budget based on uh, updated market pricing and on uh, the resources that we have in the portfolio and the loads that we're experiencing. Uh, we're also able to look at shifts that may occur between the capital and the operating budgets depending on uh, what uh, Hamid is able to do uh, during this period uh, if his construction uh, capabilities are cut back uh, by the state or by uh, uh, recommended uh, social activities and uh, operating uh, capabilities. So the COVID-19 impacts uh, might have an impact on the credit rating. That's sort of at the end of the day uh, to see how we're doing, but we do note it as a potential uh, impact and something that we'll just track. Uh, and we have impacts on the RMLD programs and services. For example, we offer residential audits. Up until COVID-19, those included a site visit as one of the delivery options. That's off the table right now. So we are switching to uh, a video audit and a uh, online uh, audit process that we're looking at uh, in order to be able to continue to deliver services even with social isolation, isolation and the inability to get to uh, customer locations to physically collect the data. Um, we also have uh, revenue and expense shifts uh, and the impacts on cash flow. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, this all sugars off to uh, what we may need for a rate adjustment if the other activities that we're looking at uh, sort of fall through. So uh, next slide, please. So power supply impacts very quickly. Um, and, and I put the math in here. I apologize. I thought I had fixed the, the line down below, but we took a look at uh, what the original budget was, which was uh, $46 million uh, divided by the 520,000 megawatt hours, three and a half percent losses translates to a retail energy price of 8.56 cents. Uh, we went and did a COVID-19 adjusted budget, 
where we uh, reduced the uh, power supply cost. We reduced the anticipated uh, load. Uh, that's supposed to be 1.035. Uh, I corrected it, but I'm not sure why that didn't take. Uh, we come up with an average rate of 0.08876 as what we would need to uh, charge at retail. So how does that translate? The current billing fuel adjustment that we have in our retail rates is 8735. So we would have expected for the remainder of the year for that to drop slightly to 8560. Um, with the COVID adjusted impact, it actually uh, rises slightly to 8876. And that uh, has an impact if we cover that through our deferred fuel reserve of $674,000. That's affordable. We have uh, more than that in the deferred re uh, fuel reserve. So basically, we can cover what we are expecting to see for a reduction in power supply revenues with the deferred fuel fund that we have. In other words, we can cover it through our existing resources. Um, next, please. So that's power supply. Now the question is, what happens to the operating portion of the budget? Well, the operating revenues for the last three quarters of the year are targeted around $23 million, 22,928. Um, that's from the 2020 budget. We assumed uniform expenditures per month an 8% reduction in sales revenue for the remainder of the year is $1,834,240. Um, we have enough in the rate stabilization fund uh, at present to be able to uh, pay that without changing the retail rates. So looking at the operating portion, looking at the power supply portion of the budget, um, we have the resources to uh, be able to manage uh, the impacts of COVID if they stay at 8%. If they move, we'll reassess the numbers. Next, please. So our response options, um, we're pretty comfortable with being able to uh, maintain rate and revenue uh, stabilities uh, throughout from the baseline uh, to the 8% um, uh, level. What's going to impact us in terms of determining low and high cases are uh, the magnitude and the duration of the impacts. We don't have any idea what those are going to be at this point, but we're tracking them and we're adjusting the model uh, accordingly. Uh, our response options in priority uh, of uh, impact is the rate stabilization fund and the deferred fuel fund. Both of those look like uh, they're satisfactory to cover it. Uh, a rate adjustment, if we need it, uh, we can reach out to suppliers for grace periods. I would uh, point out that we actually had a supplier reach out to us and ask what they could do to help. And we're currently uh, working on uh, a movement of some of our power supply expenses in 2020 uh, out a little ways, which would give us uh, a little more uh, breathing room uh, this year um, and not destabilize uh, our power supply. So um, is that it? That's the last slide, I think. Or is there one more? That's it. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. That's a very, very detailed uh, analysis and uh, looks like a great plan for the rest of the year, certainly. Do you have any questions for Chuck on this? If, if not, um, I'd like to return to item number A, which is the payment to the town of Reading. Sorry, can update. I make a quick? Yes, please, go right ahead. No, so we're gonna be using that as a template moving forward. So each month when the bills come in, the bills go out and the payments come in, we will use that same template and Chuck will update the numbers if there's any um, offset that starts to come in with deferred payments or anything like that. So Excellent. We'll, we'll so, make sure we keep so you'll be tracking time. it uh, real time. Okay. Thanks. Um, in terms of the uh, the Hi. payment, John. Sorry, it's Vanessa. I have a question for Chuck. Sure, Vanessa, please. 
Um, hi, Jack. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. You had said that um, the anticipated um, usage will um, continue to decrease through the rest of the year. Yes. Um, I, perhaps I, I didn't catch it, but what is that based on? Um, the 8% number that I use is an experience-driven number that came out of some of the uh, initial European um, experiences with this, as well as what uh, uh, some places in the United States are either uh, seeing or anticipating as well based on, on the work that they did. So uh, we're relying right now on um, information from outside sources. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Uh, good, good question, though, Vanessa. And certainly if it um, kicks back up, that's even better for us, right? But it's better to be prepared, um, which uh, we've been for many years, uh, to anticipate this kind of an event. So I think that's great work, Chuck. Um, I'd like to return to the um, item number eight, the payment to the town of Reading update. As, as we all know, um, <clears throat> we've been working on this for an exponential amount of time, probably about a year and a half or more, uh, trying to come up with the right formula uh, moving forward. And I think we're, we're pretty much there. Um, as I understand it, the, the cab I uh, met and had a preference for uh, one of the various algorithms we had uh, listed on our site. Um, the board um, of commissioners had a slightly different uh, preference. And so I think what I'd like to do is uh, propose perhaps a, a compromise tonight. Uh, and um, Mr. Uh, Hennessy, would you care to comment on that? Yes, I, I agree, John. I, I, I was at that cab meeting last week and it seemed like there was some consensus that the three-year rolling average, in fact, I think a lot of us are starting to feel like that makes a lot of sense, that um, if we're calculating on kilowatt hour sales and it's based on a three-year rolling average, that there wouldn't be any spikes um, for the other, up or down, that it would be more moderated on an annual basis. So I could, I'd like to make a motion if I can, Chair. Please, please go ahead. Okay. For the years 2021 and beyond, that the pilot payment to the town of Reading be calculated annually based on a three-year rolling average of kilowatt hour sales at the rate of 3.875 mils. And that the GM has the authority to adjust the payment as necessary in times of crisis or other reasons to maintain the fiscal stability and reliability of our MLD. Could I get a second on that, please? Anyone? Well, one one question on the on the rolling average. It, obviously, th this year becomes a part of any rolling average. The first thing I would suspect is somebody might say, "Are we going to omit this COVID crisis out of that calculation?" I think that 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 might be a question that you could anticipate. Yeah, I, I would agree that that would be a, a, a relevant question at this point. Things are a lot different than they were two months ago. Yes. Now, do do you do you take out a certain period of time right now? Well, I think what um, we could do is certainly run uh, the uh, the model to see what the effect would be. Uh, either way, the reason. Uh, we all felt the, at least on the board of commissioners, felt that the three-year rolling average was good is because it smooths out uh, any major deviations. Um, and um, the, um, the compromise on the, the mills per kilowatt hours um, was really kind of in between what the CAB recommended and what the board of commissioners were leaning towards. So we tried to kind of get in between. And I think there may be some... Um, given what we've just heard from Chuck in terms of mitigation of the impact for this particular year, that we may be able to take care of that, uh, as you suggest, Bob, uh, with um, you know, some kind of modification of it. Um, it's, it's just uh, hard to predict uh, what it's going to be moving forward. 
as we've seen over the last couple of years, we've dropped by half a percent, a percent, you know, another percent, and we've got a fixed cost environment that we have to support, obviously. So um, uh, this wouldn't even take effect until July of 2021. Uh, so the, there's a fair amount. Hey, Yes, please. Uh, yes. So I guess I would just suggest I don't I don't think this motion language is actually on on the agenda, correct? Right. Um, yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's not, Mr. 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 Chair. Let me let me say that you know, I've spent kind of the last two and a half weeks playing around with a payroll protection plan loans. So I haven't I haven't seen any information on any of this. I'd like to see the numbers. I'm uncomfortable with even seconding this or voting on this at this time. Well, I'll actually I mean, see what the effect is. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate that. I mean, the second yeah. was just basically recognize that it was there. Then there's discussion. And then, of course, the vote doesn't necessarily need to be taken if people uh, don't agree with it. Um, I believe it has been drawn up as a, and everybody will be able to view it, as what this means from a, um, uh, a financial perspective. And what we'll do before the next meeting is make sure that that's circulated so that everybody has a view of that. And um, at least from, from what I've seen of it, uh, it seems to be an excellent compromise in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, we have to- I agree, I agree, John, that the three-year the three year rolling average is better than pegging it to any particular year. I think that's something we all said, I think that was the last meeting or the one before. Yeah, given that we just heard Chuck say kilowatt hour sales might be down 8%, I do think it's prudent to um, put this motion on maybe for the next meeting and then with right. have the language yeah. be there and have have the analysis done. Sure. Of of what the numbers would yeah. look like, factoring in yeah. or out as Bob said, the, you know wh how what are we doing about this this very once in a century kind of sales? Yeah, like as the terminology, as you know, is a, it's called a black swan, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, so I, I I mean I I absolutely uh, agree with that that we should um, take a look at it before and after and. And I just—I well, don't think the intention in any of these formulae was to do a, something that would would cause an immediate sharp drop. So that's all. I think we're all kind of saying the same thing, right? Yeah, I, would, I mean, I, I, I think I think let, let, let me say one thing what, first before I recognize everybody else. Um, we've been working on this for a long, long time, and we have to get to the point of where we develop an acceptable formula. Yep. And if it, if there's some untoward event both up or down that's that's massive, obviously we come in and re, we readjust it. It is not set in concrete as we all know, but we have to get off the ball here and For just sure. thing forward. That's really all we're trying to do. Yeah. So who would like to speak? Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. John, John, let me let me go first. Let me go first. As a senior oh, no, member. Yes. I'll go first. I'm sorry, Phil, I couldn't see your hand <laughs> up. Go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I think, you know, and we support the, the, the concept. I'd like to see the numbers. Uh, we used to have a term when I a long time ago was called a blink, blinking green light, uh, and I you know where we where we actually instructed the department to go forward and kind of pursue the idea, come back to us with more information. You know, in a blinking green light, you can turn to red at any time. So that's kind of a term we used back in the old days when I first got on the board. So I'm in favor of giving you a blink, giving the department a blinking green light, getting the numbers and seeing what actually the, the, the impact of this is at this point. So that, that's my thoughts. Excellent. I, I agree with that. Any other comments, Vivek? Yeah, um, thanks, John. Uh, it's something that we had mentioned at the CAB meeting also, that I think the amount of money that comes to the town of Reading uh, includes the above the line and below the line. I think the discussion that was had here was primarily for below the line. That's correct. I think for the above the line, it's it's useful to look at the capital projects. And I think because of the storm, there's going to be some changes in how the capital is also going to be allocated. So I think to get a holistic view of what the town would get, because at the end of the day, the town is going to look at the total number. So I think it would be good to look at the total number so that they have a better sense of that. I think there's, is there any reason not to include that, uh, Colleen? No, I just wanted to make a, a comment that um, because there was such a lack of maintenance here for so long that a lot of our maintenance projects are in, actually in capital um, because they 
because they're they're not be they weren't being done cyclically as maintenance regular projects are done on an annual basis. So they were combined into capital projects for transformer replacement, service replacements, and things like that because they were at the end of their useful life. So they're imminent to failure. So all of those are still capital projects. Um, and uh, yeah, it's two percent of the net plant divided by load. But just please keep in mind that the amount of infrastructure that we're replacing is a very short range, like less than 10 years to rebuild the entire system. And then you'll be back to a normal regular increase. So you're not gonna see increases to the overall plant like you are building a new substation and replacing everything. It will, it will you know, flatten its, itself out. So it's, um, I guess what I'm saying is the above the line is pretty abnormal for what would be considered to be a normal amount of infrastructure at a normal municipal light plant. Yeah, no, so my only point was that for the next four or five years, I, I know there's a fair amount of capital spend and the net plant is gonna go up and it's just good to have that visibility. I think it's good from the town's perspective to have visibility on what the total number is gonna be. So at the well, end I, of the are day- Are you asking me to put the way it was originally, like side by side? Is that what you're asking? No, we I don't used, think we so. Used, we used to have uh, the numbers done so that you could see below the line, above the line, and then a, a total. Is that what you're asking? Uh, Colleen, what I'm suggesting is that I think the town would like to know what's the final number that the, the town is going to can plan for in the future. So, so the, whichever way you can com convey that information, I think you can say. Uh, Vivek, uh, if, if I could uh, interrupt, thank you. Uh, the town has been asking us for this for about two to three years now because they want stability moving forward. And what we're trying to explain to the town is when a black swan comes by, all bets are off. So we do our best to try to put a formula in place. And I think the formula, by the way, with, from the formula we were just talking about, the town's going to be very pleased with anyway um, because it's, it's, it's a really good compromise. And I think that one, they'll be pleased with it, but we can't spend the bulk of our meetings into the next year uh, talking about what the formula should be. We've wrestled with this thing so much. So let's go around, I agree with you, one more time, we'll look at the capital uh, in terms of how much is allocated, et cetera, but it's gonna be done in a context of a very difficult year and trying to predict, you know, if I had a crystal ball, if we all had the crystal ball predicting what was going to happen, you know, we wouldn't be at this meeting, right? We'd be on some yacht down in the Caribbean right now, perhaps, you know, <laughs> without having that <laughs> stock market drop out from our, underneath us. So, so I'm just say, saying that uh, we've done how many different variations on a theme uh, of what this was, uh, quite a few to this point. And what I'd like to do by our next meeting is have this circulated, have everyone raise whatever questions they would like, and then let's come to closure on it so we can move forward. Okay. Can I'm, I, sorry, so John, yeah. John, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not okay. asking for any new stuff to be done. All I'm saying is whatever information already, because in the past I have seen both the above yes. and the top line reported. So it's I not will, the first time. I will time. do that. It's I will always, do it's that. been reported in the past. All I'm saying is just show that. Colleen, Colleen has pledged to do that. Yes, Wendy and I will put it back in the original format, but people call and they're like, I can't see it on the computer, I can't print it out. So everyone's going to get a poster board with all of the things on it, and you can Thank add you. it up and we'll Thank send you. it out, okay? It, because the last, we, one, the last one was an eye chart if you went onto our website. Yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize. I will put the totals back in Vivek, Vivek I understand what you're saying but please if you can't see it on the computer you're going to have to just enlarge it because I I can't get everything on one sheet okay but I hear what you're saying and I will take care of it right Wendy yes absolutely okay sorry yeah, Vanessa if I may the, the simplest thing to do might be to put uh, Dave's motion you know on the agenda for the next meeting so that there's a motion language and then accompanying tables in the board book that says what that motion would would produce with both the below the line which is what it calculates and the above the line so that there's one thing out there because i do i agree with you john we're very close we've worked on this a long time it's time to move on but there's one thing to look at and then 
if there needs to be a tweak made, you know, we can do it um, at the next. Very good. I agree. Okay, so the three-year average, that's the only option with the totals above the line. And we're going to do some analysis and send out another option looking at the COVID section of reduced kilowatt hour sales. Are we all right. in agreement? And 3.875 mils, which is halfway right. between, halfway in between Got both. It. We will right. take care of it. Yeah, because none of those tables that are in the that are circulating now, they all reflect assumptions of, oh, the sales are flat, sales are up 2%, sales are down 1%. But we just heard uh, Chuck say sales this year could be down, you know, 8%. So. Y yes, um, that, that's correct. But then. So then just have those be we're doing, what we're doing, Davis. I mean, I don't want to belabor, but what we're yeah. doing is we're going to mitigate that with all of our other funds, right? To make yeah, it a yeah. whole basically through the year. And yeah, then I'm just saying those right. tables are no longer, they don't really, they're not, they're not going to happen. We already know they're not going to happen. That's all. Okay. Very good. Okay. John, if, hi, John, if I may. Yes, Vanessa, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so first, I, I'd like to thank the commissioners uh, for collaborating with the town on this. I, I know it's been um, a long journey, um, but I and the board uh, appreciate you working with us on this. So in order to continue that collaboration that we've had, that the commissioners have had with the board, uh, I wanted to ask um, perhaps the select board as a whole, I, I won't speak for all of my colleagues, but um, I know I'd appreciate a bit of time to review the new proposal. It has been tweaked slightly from what had been some of the options that had been discussed previously. This obviously has significant implications for the town budget. I, I know, you know, we've talked a lot about what the impacts are for RMLD, but as we talk about what's happening now more broadly and the revenue impacts that are happening to the town, it would be helpful if the board has the time to adequately review whatever this new proposal is. Perhaps we can discuss it a little bit further. I agree, you know, we don't want to continue to kick this can down the road. It would be nice to wrap it up, but um, having the board involved, I think, you know, contributes to that spirit of the, the commissioners and the board members working together. Um, so is there a timeline for when we might anticipate having that so that the board has that time? Um, I think the, uh, the calculations that we've been talking about uh, for the 3.875 and three-year moving average, rolling average, uh, that's pretty much done. Um, yeah, it was put up on the website on March 19th. Yeah. Uh, actually, we have, Tracy has the 3.875 that Wendy just sent her. If you want to put it up, it doesn't have COVID impact, but if you want to show that. Um, right, and we can send this out to everyone. We can put it on the website so you have time to kind of take a look at it and and to try and understand what the COVID um 19 impact is going to be on it. Okay, so here we go. So this would go into motion uh, July 1st, 2021. This three points, Wendy, is this 3.875? Yes, if you if you look down the, the uh, mills per kilowatt oh, hour. Right, 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 column, okay. It's 3.875. So you can see what the impact is in terms of the below the line uh, payment. You know, yeah. On there, a three-year average with, let's see, this one is um, uh, yeah, the title is the title's yeah, wrong. Yeah, the title's wrong. Uh, go down to the next one. Okay, right here. If sales remain flat, so it goes from today's of two point four eight million up to 2.5409 a million. That's based on flat sales? No, it's based on, that's what it says is based on flat sales. Yeah. And then if we go down to the next one, which is... So, John, I, I've reviewed these. I know that um, the board, uh, the now the board chair, Mark Doxer, um, had proposed some alternatives um, to these, some of them that included um, a base minimum and a max um, to help create sort of guardrails, if you will, around payments to protect both the town and RMLD for fluctuations in um, yes. kilowatt hour sales. Yes. So has, yeah. that, has 
the commissioners had the commissioners reviewed those proposals we, we have reviewed those proposals and we felt that they were not appropriate for what we were trying to do yeah and more than that to add to that john that we had this two months ago and the cab reviewed it and the cab didn't uh, the cab voiced uh, that having a revenue based factor was not appropriate so we we did have that process correct um well, I mean, Mark did a tremendous amount of work on that. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, he didn't. I, I talked a lot with Mark about it. And, um, you know, we, we did have those conversations. We did closely review what Mark produced and gave us in January. So now it's April. So we, we did go through all that two months ago. So I think all we're, all we're for my part, my, we're so close here. I just think we need to see Dave's um, motion language, what the tables would be, how COVID fa factors in. And I think it's gonna it's gonna still be kind of in these ballparks. And it's worth noting that the payments that 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 RMLD gives to Reading is is by far the highest in the state of Massachusetts. Right. And you know, the town is not in it. shape. I mean, from a cash flow perspective, the town has double what the finance committee thinks is a conservative amount. Uh, so it's not So yeah. John, I, I appreciate that, but you know, sticking strictly to um, you know, there, there's much larger um, considerations for that both RMLD and, and the town of Reading have as far as reserves. Um, and I think it is safe to say that we are very fortunate that both RMLD and the town have budgeted very conservatively and that we're fortunate to have those reserves, especially at a time like yeah. this. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the staff deserve, on both sides deserve a lot of credit for that work that they do that have gotten us here. Um, I think as far as the most recent proposal goes um, that the commissioners intend on voting on at the next meeting, if the select board can review that um, before it goes to vote, I think that would be appreciated. When is your next meeting? We're meeting weekly. So it's... Okay. Um, so you, you'll have the information to be able to take a look at it. And so we'll meet tomorrow and then we'll meet uh, either next Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay. So can I yeah, so this is actually new, Vanessa. You haven't seen this. Um this is three point eight seven five. Um the the sentence above it where it says four percent is wrong, so we'll change that. But uh I will just redo this one. These numbers are correct for three point eight seven five and three year averaging because that hadn't been suggested before. But I will add I'll have Wendy add on the total with the above the line payment and any adjustment that we think would be necessary for COVID or for impact to capital to the above the line payment on So there. for the sake of the board's understanding, can we keep the above the line and below the line separate? Because the equation as we're talking about revisiting affects only one and not the other. So so taking the payment in whole is not entirely accurate from from the way well, the we're, town does. Vanessa, we're talking about keeping it. What you're seeing on this chart is the below the line payment. I mean, that's the bulk of the payment. I mean, that's the yes, large. Yes, absolutely, payment. absolutely. Um, what I would ask is if the above the line could be kept separate from that. Well, it is separate. This it's always separate. Yes. Yeah. No, this, it, this is yeah. just they, showing we used the. To have, we used to have a box. That was this box and then another box connected to it. So you could actually see both boxes. And then Wendy had a total across, but they were two separate boxes. One was above the line, one was below the line. So based on Vivek's request, I think if that would be helpful, I'll put it back like that. So it looked just like this with a box next to it with a total, but they won't yes. be integrated. Yes, be I think that's a great idea, Colleen, because I think okay. the select board looks at this, they need to see, okay, the, the formula only affects the below the line, but there's also this other piece, and it's it also changes, and we'll be going up with, with our capital investments. Correct. That's what, that's, what, that's, what, that's what Vivek was saying. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, Okay, good. I think we've wrestled this one enough. Yep. Can we move on? Yep. Um, let's see. Thank uh, you. No, you're welcome. Um, did uh, Chuck? Did you did you cover the home information sessions and the new rebate programs? I did not, but I'm glad to. Very quickly, um, we got through two of the four uh, home information sessions. We usually schedule uh, one in each town annually, 
uh, before COVID shut down uh, our, our social interactions. And we are looking at creating a webinar uh, either with a voiceover or that we could present in a uh, Zoom uh, meeting format uh, to allow people to interface with uh, the information uh, that we would normally present. We'd post it on the web page or run one uh, webinar that on two separate nights that all four towns could be invited to. We're still finalizing that, but we're, we're looking for ways uh, sort of around the, uh, the social isolation uh, issues that we have right now. Um, with respect to new programs, uh, just wanted to call your attention to the fact, and, and these are posted uh, on the website, that uh, we have a heat pump program. Uh, we have two rebates uh, under that program so far. Um, Dave Talbot is probably aware of this already, but the solar program uh, through DOER has been extended to the end of the year. Oh, great. Uh, and uh, we are launching a yard products uh, program where we're going to put rebates on electrically operated lawnmowers, weed whackers, chainsaws, blowers, uh, and tractors. Uh, so we're doing that. As part of launching the heat pump program, uh, we got some feedback from the uh, CAC uh, here in Reading, and uh, we added a program to do uh, panel change outs, uh, either upgrades if those are necessary, uh, or we've included the, uh, the new smart panel uh, in the in the rebate incentive. So we've just got some additional activity that uh, we wanted to bring to everybody's attention. May I ask a question, Mr. Chair? No. Oh, I'm sorry. That's up to the chair. Oh, yes, please. Um, so Chuck, we're, we're on track. What, there's still going to, there's still like $200,000 worth of, or more, 400000 worth of this special solar rebate that's available through the end of this year. Is it something like that? Uh, it's a little bit less than 200,000 at this point. Uh, is that combined or is that the RMLD half of the D of the DOE? Well, I, I'm talking about the RMLD half. The, so the, then when you put them together, there's 400 grand still available for people in the RMLD service area. And that includes municipalities to use for solar uh, projects. And it's a very gen, I can tell you from personal experience, it's a very generous rebate. So that's, and Chuck, is it fair to say that, we're in nowhere near on track to have that money spent based on the permitting you're seeing or the applications you're seeing? Um, at the rate that we've been going, uh, I would not expect that we would spend that through the year. Okay, we so I just, we have two select board members on this call. It's worth noting there's this money sitting there that could be used for, for solar projects in Reading or in the other towns, um, and it's sitting there ready to be used. It's $1.20 a watt. And so I can tell you, I'm doing it on my house. It's, it's going to give me like a third of the cost. And then when you factor in the federal tax credit, it's another third. I mean, it's ridiculously good. And the town could be taking advantage of it, as could anybody else um, out there. And it's sad that, you know, yeah, we're all in tough times right now, but this thing is sitting there to be used. And um, I just would hope that everybody does something to get the word out so that it does get used. That's all. Okay. Thank you. And can I ask a question? Chuck, yes, did you talk about me. did you talk about the virtual audits, home audits? He did. Uh, I had mentioned them in the uh, oh, yeah. COVID right. assessment, but uh, what we're doing is going through a comprehensive assessment for alternatives to deliver the efficiency programs uh, in the current and uh, anticipated going forward uh, social isola isolation uh, environment that we're working in. So we're looking at virtual audits. Uh, we are looking at uh, solar. Uh, in addition to the incentives that uh, are offered through DOER for behind the meter solar, uh, I would remind uh, all four uh, communities that uh, we're looking at uh, solar 
uh, program to put it out on uh, existing uh, public and large commercial facilities uh, on a subscription basis, similar to the Solar Choice One and Solar Choice Two programs. Uh, so we're we're trying to be as active as we can um, and see what we can do to to keep things going. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Could we move into the engineering and operations report, Hamid? You're on mute. Yeah, I think you might be on mute, Hamid. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I guess we, I, I gave the uh, report. That was the report on COVID-19. Oh, okay. You did. That was, sorry. okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so I think we're moving into the um, procurement request requiring board okay. approval. Yep. You ready for the mo motion, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. All right. Move to recommend the general manager through the materials manager purchase for parents for the number Toyota hybrid Highlander SUVs with trade in from MHQ Inc. for Hair, H A R R Toyota. For $151,997 and one Ford F-150 eco-friendly pickup truck with trade-in from Marcotte Ford Sales Inc. for $32,536 and 50 cents pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30B Statewide Contract VEH-98. The total of all four vehicles is $184,000. $533.50. I mean, yes, Mr. Oh. Chair. Uh, this, you get a second. You get a second. Oh, on I'm that? sorry. Let's get a second, please. Second. Is, this is not a bid. This is just that is. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, wait. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. No, again. Yes. I'm sorry. Sorry, the internet probably. Yeah, this is not a bid. Uh, this is basically we got quotes uh, from the state master vehicle list. State, it's a state contract. So we sent the bid to not the bid, the the uh, request for quote uh, to uh, many dealers, and only four responded. So as a result, uh, you know, we, are, we had a specific uh, specification too. Like for the SUVs, we needed uh, the cubic feet space uh, anywhere between 66 to 87 cubic feet. And uh, the ones that they're currently in the market on the PHEV and BEV, uh, they are basically uh, very small. They're not big enough for the engineers so they can put their tools and everything that they need into the, the truck. Uh, so, uh, so. You dropped out. The, the total, uh, let me go. Yeah, let me go over the budget for you. For two, 2020, we put in for $75,000. And in 2019, we budgeted $50,000 for a pickup. So the total is gonna bring it to 125,000. But the, the price of these five vehicles total together is 140, 184, $533.50, which means uh, we're going over by 59,533.50. Can, can I add in that? And, and the vehicles, they were carefully selected. Yes, the yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, so um, I think one of the parts that we're missing is so we have a 30 point. Uh, electric vehicle um, program, pretty comprehensive. And one of the parts of the program is the fleet transition for us to come out with a fleet transition to electric um, and to take that fleet transition and then to be able to offer it to town transitions and our customers. And we've spent a significant amount of time. We sent out requests for information to all of the electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid, and no one responded with the capacity that we needed for um, storage. Um, the only one that came back as an SUV was a Mitsubishi out in Wilmington, but the majority of the uh, storage compartment is, is the physical battery. And as Hamid said, we needed about 60 cubic feet. 
the reason why we're going over is because we didn't replace the vehicles last year and part of the year before because we were waiting for the electric technology to come in. And now we're to the point where we have a number of vehicles where we just can't physically get uh, the inspection stickers anymore because they're rusted out in the bottom. So we've had a number of NEPA conversations with the other general managers and we're just to the point where we, we have to replace the vehicles. We even looked at leasing. Now, the only way that leasing for a short period of time proved to be cost beneficial is if we did the entire fleet, which we didn't want to do. So I just wanted to add to what Hamid was saying that we really did a lot of homework on this because it was our, we even had XL in Boston, Boston. which was the only company that will come in and do a transition to an existing F-150. And they tried $25,000 to put a battery the size of a, you know, it's it's almost one third of the, of the the bed of a pickup truck is mm -hmm. the battery, and it's twenty five thousand that you add on to a new F one fifty truck. It's called XL in Boston. You can look it up. We even had them come in, so I just wanted to add that to you so that you would understand how much work we've done and how excited we are for a transition for electrification. But the technology is just not there. Not there, right. So just to add more to that, for the SUV types, there are no BEVs or PHEVs, SUV type vehicles uh, for sale at the present time. The PHEVs are expected to arrive sometime in summer of 2020. Uh, however, even when they come in, they're not going to be all-wheel drive as we required. And uh, so HEVs are currently available for sale on the SUV class. And as far as the pickup trucks, uh, currently they don't have any BEV or PHEVs or HEV pickup trucks uh, for sale. And they're expected to arrive sometimes in 2021 on the BEV and HEV class or model. So like what Colleen said, we've been, this thing we've been going on, it's been a research project for us for past uh, six to seven months. And we are right now, we desperately need the vehicles, the SUV is for engineers and one pickup truck because the, most of the vehicles are disabled and we desperately need those. Is there uh, any other discussion? If not, I believe, it, does this have to be a roll call vote? Yes, yes. Um, John Stempek, aye. Is the head of CI? Talbot, aye. Mr. Pizzino, aye. Let it be noted there was 5-0 in favor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I Thanks think for we're, all the work you put into that too, Hamid, Colleen. Yeah, it's, re it's really unfortunate we couldn't go electric on it. I just, yeah. it's really a shame. But. It's a wicked bummer. It's really, we really thought that it was going to be happening and then we had the program all set up of what we were going to offer to the towns for transition fleet and customers, but maybe we can try again next year. Okay. Thank you. I think we're into uh, just the general discussion to our next board meeting, Thursday, May 21st. Yep. Is that yes, reasonable? That's fine, with me. Everyone? fine with me. Okay. Uh, just, just one update, Mr. Chairman, when you get yes. a minute. Yes, ready? please. Go right ahead, Phil. I have, I have emailed to me this afternoon our, all the, uh, the warrant to be signed, to signed uh, virtually or electronically here. So I guess I am the, uh, the first one to have this done. So I got six emails with the copies of the warrant. And I also have a, an email that was sent to me probably about an hour ago, about an hour and a half ago, to get an electronic signature. So just to update you, uh, the process has changed, so hopefully it all works right for me tonight. <laughs> that's, before that's I go home. Excellent. <laughs> Welcome to the yeah. 21st century, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Colleen, Colleen's been promising this for a while, so she finally oh. got it done. <laughs> yeah, that was my goal. No more chiseling on a rock. It just took me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd um, be surprised what people get done when... when uh, you know, when things get tough, everybody works together. It's awesome. The um, follow-up um, board meeting is, is scheduled for June 18th. That's getting a little bit further out. Uh, so perhaps we uh, we just note that in our uh, next 
our next meeting to make sure that people can make that or need to change it. Uh, for the CAD meeting, May, uh, Mr. Talbot? Yep. Excellent. And June is Mr. Coulter. Excellent. Thank you. I think we're uh, we're finished. I have a, any other comments? Yes, please, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one question. I, I I know Colleen had provided some information about um, customers asking for rebates. I might have missed it in the beginning, so I I apologize. But the example was the Burbank Arena, um, where they were going to be um, doing, you know, potentially a morgue for the town. And they had to stay in operation and they were looking to the well colleen was pointing to us to see if we would have the authority to lower their rates i don't know if there was a discussion regarding uh, that not specifically on that topic uh there wasn't you want me to yes colleen would you uh, yeah so i just i notified the commissioners that that was a request but um you know, that's why I said with the rate doctrine, uh, we're not allowed to give discounts or waivers, but we can work with them on uh, payment plans. Um, but I provided all of the electrical consumption to the fire chief as requested, um, and we were more than willing to work with them on that. I mean, we couldn't just waive anything because it's we're not for profit and it's customer money. So unfortunately, all we can do is really work with payment plans. But I I never heard back from them that they wanted uh, the equipment not disassembled. My understanding is it takes five days to reassemble it and get the ice back up if if that um, unfortunately was the case. But um, I think Chuck maybe next month can provide an update with, with people who are requesting payment plans, like what the numbers are. But, you know, so far it's been... Um, not it's just been regular correct me if i'm wrong chuck right we haven't had any major changes yet for payment plans not that i'm aware of yeah i i guess that situation was a little different because they were saying the town was mandating that they stayed open they would have shut down so their bill would have you know obviously decreased so i didn't know if there was any discussion um relating to allowing them to shut down I provided all the information requested of me to the fire chief, yep. um, but I didn't hear anything back. Um, Are they open for um, or available for any of the federal or state assistance programs? Do you know, Bob? I, I, I don't. And, and that would be something I, I think um, they'll have to investigate to, to find out if they, if they can. But I think what I was reading into it is they were looking to get a get a re the town was making them stay open so they were looking for either a discount rate or obviously some assistance from the town to stay in operation where they normally they would have been able to shut down but because they're being you know being mandated to stay open it's a little little different situation so i don't know if the select board had any any input on that uh karen do you know or vanessa do you know if they've is you know, that's the first I've heard of that. I, I was taking notes. I, I Do you have any idea why they would be needed to stay? There were going to be a temporary morgue. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it doesn't look like we need it, thank goodness. But um, yeah. that was one of the functions. Well, the, their function. Um, well, you know, so there, there are FEMA funds and things. And the town is tracking everything they've done and extra expenses they've spent related to this. Uh, perhaps that's an item that could be included. So I, I did write that down and I'll follow up. What Thank we you. have done is offered to track the energy usage uh, at any facilities that have been um, co-opted for uh, COVID-19 related activities. Uh, the ice arena obviously being uh, one of them. So we are able with our metering system uh, to track uh, usage date to date and be able to uh, the financial impact of uh, them uh, staying open in the case of the ice arena or uh, continuing operations or opening operations uh, if it's a shelter, although there probably aren't a lot of uh, community shelters in this instance that would be used because of the social isol isolation protocols. But yes, we are 
tracking any facilities that are uh, that we're made aware of. The ice arena was one. Uh, the log cabin facility, John, that uh, we used is another. Yep. Uh, and so we'll make that information available for uh, support in uh, FEMA reimbursement filings. Are there any other uh, questions or things that would you, anyone would like to bring up? Otherwise, we'll take a vote to move into executive session. Okay. Could I have a motion, motion please? Mr. Yeah, move that the board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real estate and to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Do you have a second, please? Second. Um, Mr. Pacino, Mr. aye. Aye. Mr. Talbot, aye. Coulter, right. How how are we going to work? We got to I got to redial in again. Yeah, we got a different link. Tracy sent us yeah. different phone number, different link. Yeah. Okay. Right. You Thanks. should say that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank I'm going to end Thanks. this and I'll open that. Yep. And thank.